Welcome everyone. Um, uh, it's great to be with you here in person and online. Uh, I'm excited to give this lecture as I have been for uh, each of this class. Um, and once again, I'll be uh, speaking today about some issues that are perennially in the background for agent-based modeling processes, often in the foreground, but um, which, which have been very little sort of adequately dealt with, um, you know, poorly, poorly dealt with at this point in the literature. And um, I'm gonna be sharing combinations of my personal experience, aspects of, uh, of, of my sort of war stories over 30 years, uh, 30 plus, 30 to 35 now years, working with agent-based models and um, in some of the work, um, some of the gaps we identified and some of the work we've been doing to fill those gaps. Um, but also hopefully learning more about, about agent-based models for those new to them. Um, so as I had mentioned to some people waiting here, uh, I posted to the course site um, a set of materials that uh, are of considerable significance. Uh, one is an updated set of slides. I've been really working to, to supplement uh, the materials uh, for uh, last lecture and this lecture. That does include some added material for last lecture, which I think additionally illustrates some of the concepts that I discussed, but it also includes quite a lot for, for this lecture. So that's one set of, of materials. The second set that are on the, uh, on the uh, course site, the Canvas site, are uh, some materials on the ODD protocol. Um, and uh, this is a protocol that's used for systematically thinking through the elements of agent-based models and documenting those elements. It can be used for form model formulation or making steps towards that, getting a clear idea in mind of, of, of what you're seeking in terms of model formulation. Um, and uh, those ODD slides won't be ones that I go over today. It is possible I'll have a bespoke lecture just for that at some point outside the normal lectures, but we don't have time to, to go over them in detail, but I will touch on it and I will comment on some broad features of it. And I provided you a whole slide deck that can help you think through what's needed for an ODD description. ODD is a protocol we've used for a number of our modeling projects. Um, it's well documented in the literature. It's been used for many other models, agent-based models. And um, getting some familiarity with it uh, is a real asset in agent-based modeling. So that's posted to the website as well. You'll find both of those in the, in the slides area. Um, beyond that, I posted two models that I'd like to download here. Um, and we're gonna be firing up our any logics and exploring them. Um, uh, we're going to be exploring them to learn some general lessons, reinforce earlier lessons, and, and to situate ourselves with some concrete issues that I'm going to be trying to address in some of my slides um, uh, during, this, uh, during this lecture. And there are a few things in my experience that do that better than encountering a model, seeing its structure, seeing its behavior, and uh, and then being able to refer back to that in the lecture. So I, I do have um, uh, two models posted. One of them was posted previously, and that's a model on GIS and food environment. You'll find it up there in the models, uh, interactive models for use in class. I'll be showing that. Uh, but the other one is a hierarchical infection transmission model that will have special significance for some of our discussion of model mapping. And I'd like you to, to download those um, and, and to open those. And I'll, I'll rehearse it. There are some people here that weren't there the last time we did that. And I, I'll, I'll go over that, but I need to move quickly on those so we don't shortchange uh, the subsequent lecture materials, okay? So um, first of all, let's get our any logics fired up, okay? And um, hopefully you can be fired up as well. So I'm going to uh, share my screen and 
we'll just run through this. So I already have my, my any logics up. If you call yours up again for the first time, you may get to this sort of screen, in which case you want to minimize it here. Okay. The screen's not sharing. Screen is not sharing. Well, I'll be. Okay. So what what happened there? Oh, oh, that's interesting. Um somehow it it mistook it for leaving. Is it now sharing? Okay. Can anyone confirm through a hand online that it's sharing my screen? Yep. Anyone? Yes. Sorry. Yes. yes. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Hearing you is is unfortunately difficult uh, due to no fault of your own. It's just the audio setup right now. So what I had shown is that when you call any logic up, often you'll come to this sort of screen and you can you can minimize it like that. Okay. Now. Um, you will start with a blank slate um, here. Uh, I'll I'll start with the blank slate. Um, uh, no, okay. Um, and just so you can see that uh, over on the left hand side. Okay. Um, now I want to go to the course site and I want to download those two models. Um, so again. Taking baby steps here, and I'm not going to I'm not going to be going through this further beyond today, because uh, we're going to need to be more nimble. But um, for the the area of the site called models for interactive use in class, there's a model called GIS Food Environment Version Six. If you click on that, you can go through, and it will give you some info on it. And basically, you click on this link. And it will download it to your computer. And likewise for this hierarchical infection transmission model. Okay. So you're going to want both of those available. Okay. And we're going to we're going to go through each. Um, so the first one I'm going to go through is the food environment one. And this is going to relate to this exercise I'm giving you, um, which I, I, I got to get out uh, in the next day here. Um, Okay, so so I'm gonna go through that with you. So I'm gonna go into any logic. And basically for you, you would go down, you'd go open it where wherever you downloaded it, the, the location to which you downloaded it. Um, as it happens, I already have them um, previously opened, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna just open that. Okay. And um uh, you can open more than one model at a time. Uh, that's fine. Um, and uh, I'm going to, to have them both. But I'm going to start with this food environment. Maybe I'll close the other model for now, just to avoid confusion. OK, so, so if, if we go to this model and we double click on main, what you will see is um, an environment. Um, we had said uh, from this floor that that uh, each of those models are composed of one or more populations of individuals characterized by fixed characteristics, pre-specified characteristics, um, uh, commonly called parameters, uh, and changing state. Those in individuals, whoever, uh, while they evolve according to actions triggered by rules, one of the most central features of agent-based modeling is that they interact with each other and with the environment via an environment. Um, and this is the environment in which these agents are put. I sometimes comment to my students that agent-based modeling really mimics in some ways much of the philosophy or follows the accords with the philosophy of critical realism, which talks about context, mechanism, and outcome. And here we see context. It's a, it's a geographic context. Now, in this case, we have agents situated um, in this context. And those agents, in this case, are of multiple types. There's a convenience store. There's a home. There's a park. There's a person and a supermarket. If we go to person, we will see a, a, a sort of theory of personhood. Uh, each person is associated with a home. They have a certain hankering for convenience store meals as compared to, to um, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables uh, available through, uh, through, fresh, uh, through uh, supermarkets or other vegetable 
um, and, and uh, other you know uh, grocery markets. Um, and they have some changes that occur over them, some evolution in their weight, which depends on energy intake and expenditure from both physical activity and from um, from uh, basal energy expenditure, just just kind of the energy they they burn to keep the body alive. And uh, those those factors involved in physical activity are affected by park distance from park, distance from home to park, etc. And this is a person who, over time, seeks out um, to purchase food, engages in food procurement, either from a convenience store to a supermarket. And you can bet that their, their preferences have something to do with that, as well as their, the distance that they have to go to each. So in other words, supermarkets that are closer are more attractive to go to. Um, but a, you know, a close convenience store might, might outweigh uh, a distant grocery store. And then there's some decision-making logic as to what they actually eat in a given meal, for example, here, um, uh, as to which type of, of food to eat. So this is a theory of personhood, and we don't have time to go into it in detail. Uh, you'll find other videos of me building up this model with students interactively. But it's a theory of personhood that involves all the elements we've talked about. There are characteristics um, uh, of an individual that are fixed, like their home or their preferences for convenience store meals. There's evolving aspects of state indicated in this state chart by these possible states they could be in, indicated in this stock and flow model over here to the right by a, by a stock indicating their weight, uh, state variable. There's actions that change those states. So for example, these transitions between the state here or these flows that change the, 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 the value of the state variable, the stock, those are all aspects of actions, the, the things that change um, the situation. And the rules that govern them are variously encoded uh, in associated with these transitions. For example, this one here, um, uh, involving going from a supermarket to home, uh, we assume that it takes them a certain amount of time, say an hour, to get home on the bus. Um, uh, or, or seeking food transition is triggered by what's called a message, under, under, which occurs under certain circumstance. By contract, in, in the stock and flow diagram, we have um, kind of the, the rules being characterized by equations. So this is a this is a model that involves a theory of personhood. Um, there's mechanism here, as we say in critical realism. We're characterizing our theory of the world, our, 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 our theory about the mechanisms that drive behavior. And those individuals are situated in an environment that's broader, where they can interact with each other and with the environment. And here they're situated geographically. Um, they are placed in an environment that also includes parks, Beyond their homes, it includes parks, involves supermarkets and convenience stores, um, and uh, they are constrained by that environment. Um, they might live close to a convenience store, but distant from a, um, from a grocery store. They might have to cross the Yarra River here in Melbourne to, to make it to a, uh, a grocery store in ways that would incline them to eat more convenience store meals. Now, as we've said, um, uh, these are more than models. They're more than kind of characterizations in an explicit form of our theory. They are also precise enough models to be simulated. And so we could run um, uh, some, some theory about this. Uh, we could run this theory and see its logical implications over time. So in this baseline area, we'll, we'll say run here. And uh, by running this environment, this model, we will see the logical implications writ large of that theory. We will see what that theory leads to in terms of behaviors over time. And when I'm talking behavior, I don't just mean strictly human behavior from a behavioral social science aspect, but also things like their change in weight, et cetera. So if we're running this, we'll actually see um, some individuals, for example, there's an individual here, an individual here living in a home. And those individuals, if you look closely, they're hopping back and forth 
engaged in for food procurement behavior. Some are going to this grocery store um, just, uh, just up here. Some are, are making it to this convenience store and we could slow it down and see it in more detail. But you'll also notice that these individuals end up differing in girth. They end up differing in their, um, uh, in their weight. Um, and if we were to go over here to this panel, the developer panel, and we were to go drag down here, down to population, we could see for particular individuals, their particular weight dynamics um, and how that's been changing over time in response to their behavior. We could also see their preference for convenience store meals compared to supermarket meals. And we could observe and keep track of information on their behavior over time longitudinally in a way that would be quite out of the question with an aggregate model. So this person is, is, is 75 pounds, whereas their um, analog with a rather strong predilection for convenience store meals, a hankering that puts their weight at risk um, has a much higher weight here. Um, so these individuals are embedded in this environment and, and they are interacting with the environment. We have mechanism described for those they are placed in a context and there are outcomes per the idea of critical realism. So if we go up to the next level and press this button here, we're going up to this level, we will see that there are dynamics induced emergent dynamics from this induced about the weight across the population, for example, um, that are induced uh, at a population level. Um, in other versions of the model, some people here have seen, we have scatter plots showing the relationship between weight and distance person lives from a grocery store, um, a store with fresh fruits and vegetables, uh, or relating the weight to their distance from a park, et cetera. Those are induced patterns. They are patterns that result from the model. And those uh, are often articulated from the model so that we can compare model results against what we see from the world. I've gone light on this at this time, but a key component of this is we can run this model with different particular assumptions. For example, we could assume weekend convenience store preference for those uh, far from a, a, a supermarket, or, or we could um, impose it across the entire population. We could also do things like um, go and add supermarkets to our delight into areas which, which are um, bereft of them. I'm doing that by clicking on this map. So I could surround this individual that seems to be um, uh, seems to need a bit of, of help um, with, uh, with fresh fruit and vegetable markets. And now you'll notice that they're engaging in food seeking behavior in those markets rather than in more distant, uh, or rather than in convenience stores that might be close to them. And that's inevitably going to end up affecting their weight because they will be going to nearby markets. And if we ran this forward, um, we would see this person's weight trajectory um, uh, move in a in a favorable direction because of their their consumption of fresh fruits and vegetables over time, rather than surviving upon yellow screaming yellow zonkers and tim tams in in this sort of uh, market there at uh, this uh, convenience store. So this is this is an agent based model. There's a lot going on there and. One of the things I want you to start thinking about is what's exogenous here, what's endogenous, and what's ignored when it comes to this sort of setup. We're ignoring massive numbers of things. There are some intriguing things put in there, but some of these things that are placed in here are placed in an exogenous fashion and some in an endogenous fashion. And I'm going to ask you in a little exercise to try to sort those out and we'll be discussing it in class. So this is one model I want you to bear in mind. It's a model of, you know, of situated individuals and environment, one of the hundred or so I provided to you. Let's go to the other model if I, if I could. Um, so I, I wanna stop that. Um, by the way, you can do that through this red button up here, or you could do it through a, a red button in that developer panel over there. Um, 
there may also be other windows uh, visible like the console, um, which would allow you, or other windows that would allow you to, to stop. Yes, Maurice raised his hand. Um, maybe, Thanks, Nate. Um, uh, Maurice, do you want to try to articulate it? I'll, I'll try to hear you. Yeah, I think it's a simple question. Um, I mean, I, I attempted to uh, click on, on the map and indeed uh, landed some super. I was wondering what, what's, how does it know what agent to, uh, to place when you click on it? So, so when you click on the map and it creates a supermarket, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, what, uh, why, yeah. why okay. it? I'll show you exactly. So there's a question here. This is a, a question about the specifics of this model rather than you know, broader issues of modeling. There was a question on, when I clicked on the map, it added a supermarket. How did it know to do that? Like, where did that logic come from? Well, there's no magic here. <laughs> In short, um, I told it to do that. Um, I, I, I ordered it and it obeyed me. So, so where did I order it? Well, if you go to Maine, if you go down Maine, um, I can say that to a fellow New Englander, um, and you go to the map um, and uh, you go, so I'm, I'm actually not running the model. I wanna be clear. I'm called up, um, called up Maine, click on the map, and I go down to advanced uh, with reference to map. So each object that you select here has some properties. And you can see there's a properties window and I can see them. There's this advanced area that I could expand or not. And one of the things in the advanced area is on click. And that says, what to do if I'm clicked, uh, if, if someone clicks on me, a user clicks on me, and what do I do? Well, lo and behold, <laughs> I add a supermarket and I set the latitude and longitude to be where I clicked. Um, and I add it to my set of supermarkets that people consider for their food seeking behavior. So the curtain is drawn back and the person behind the, the, the curtain is shown who happens to be <clears throat> myself. Is, is that helpful? Uh, that's exactly what I was wondering. <laughs> yeah. It's pretty, pretty interesting and kind of cool that you could do that. I'm just, uh, yeah. Was, yeah, yeah. So um, any logic is actually has a um, quite sophisticated capacity to modify user uh, interface elements. Um, and you can actually set up a rather um, textured uh, user interface with sliders and buttons and, you know, uh, links you can click through and images and and you can interact with particular elements here. There are limits. For example, you can't say make control click at a person's home there or something like that. It's 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 limited in in, in what it can do. But so are all all platforms. But it's it's pretty powerful for for what it will allow you to do. Yeah. And you can choose your you know you could have it add something different based on you know you select add you know element. Uh, uh, I want, when I click, I want to add supermarkets or I want to add people's homes or I want to add convenience stores or what have you, or parks, yeah. Okay. Can, can, you, all, can you also blow up supermarkets or is it just adding them? Yeah, no, you can delete them. Yeah, sure. But if I, <laughs> yeah, I, I, could, I could create food deserts if, uh, in the model and I could see their implication over time. For for you know the health of the population, absolutely, yeah, that'll be very readily done. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well. Yep. Probably enough yep. on that. I just was I was I was intrigued. That's all. So thank you for the. Yeah. No, absolutely. The... Yeah. Um. Okay. Um. Uh. So. Uh. Yeah. I, I'm inclined to have just like tomorrow we're having an outside session for this class, for one purpose. I'm inclined to have some outside sessions for helping people with, uh, with um, questions about implementation, um, uh, model issues and how to do things and frameworks and so on. So that's one of the things I'm working on. Um, without a TA, it's, it's a little bit more limited, but I'll see what I can do. Okay, so this was one model I wanted you to have in mind as we're discussing things. It has a certain scope. It has certain things represented endogenously, exogenously. In other words, there's things that it generates, there are things that we tell it, um, and, uh, and then there's things that are, that are omitted from it. Um, uh, 
it also shows you a little bit about those state charts again, which you saw earlier, but I want you to be reminded of for some of today's discussion. Okay, let's go to the other model. Okay, and I'm going to load that in. And I think we're big boys and girls, so I'm going to, to load it in in a way that I don't close the other one in case I want to come back to it. Okay, so I load in the hierarchical infection transmission model. And this one has some lessons to learn for us. So in this model, we have, uh, once again, a theory of personhood, double click on person, and it's a theory of personhood having to do with natural history of infection of a person. Mm -hmm. okay. um, people go through a set of states of susceptible and once infected, they become exposed, they go through a latent state of infection. In other words, in which they're infected, but not infectious. Then they become infectious. Whilst in an infectious state, they can communicate the infection to others um, with a certain contact rate going off according to a certain hazard. So that's an action being triggered uh, uh, by a rule. In this case, it's a hazard rate. It goes off with a certain chance per unit time. Um, and they can go to a recovered state. And once again, as in the past model, this state chart encodes at once the possible states they can be in with respect to particular condition. In this case, there's only one of concern, infection. It characterizes the actions that change those states. And it characterizes also within the same state chart, the rules that govern those actions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so here we have a theory of personhood. But that that person is actually, in this case, not directly embedded in Maine. They are in an environment, but in what environment are they located? They're an environment of a particular city. So if you go actually to person and you go look at person um, and you were to uh, to poke around a little bit and you were to scroll up here, what you'd find is they live in a certain city. They are embedded in a city. A city has a certain population. And the city is a happening place. It has things going on. It has interventions that it can perform. We'll come back to that point. There's, there's actions. There's, there's um, important types of dynamics occurring, not only at the individual level, but also at the city level. And then there's an environment of Maine, which includes multiple cities, a number of cities. Um, so here we have this. This theory, context, mechanism, outcome. Again, context, cities, and these cities are themselves in a network of cities, but each city contains a set of people. Mechanism, characterizing the mechanics of the evolution of particular people, their interaction, like with, with exposing each other to infection. And some, some mechanics also associated with cities. Um, so if we if we go look at that city, we'll find that the city has some logic where if the intervention, if the prevalence of infection in the city passes a certain threshold, it will intervene. Um, it will think of it triggering a lockdown or something. It will intervene upon the population to reduce it, said transmission is the idea. Um, so there's logic, there's mechanism there. And there's, there turns out there's outcomes. Um, outcomes in terms of, say, the, the number of people infected across the entire population over time, but also outcomes in terms of things like the number of people infected in each city. So let's go run, let's go run something here. Let's go run the baseline if we could. Don't mind me if I do. Um, so I'm going to go run the baseline. I'll say run. Whoa, whoa, sorry, sorry. I clicked. Uh, on it initially, and then I, I switched over, so you may not have been able to see. I right-clicked on baseline, and I said, run. So I said, enact this model. Tell me the logical consequences of that theory, and I'm running it. And what you'll see is here that people will be placed in these cities. You can see them here, and those cities are joined together in a network. That's that, those sort of lines there. Um, and uh, some of these people, it turns out, it's not so obvious uh, here, but some of those people 
um, will be told to start will be told to start uh, infected. In fact, you can kind of see them over here. And aha, this city declared a lockdown now, but the infection is spreading via these road networks. Some of those people have migrated to this other city. If you want, you could to be more florid, you could think of them as fleeing. So now they're now they're in this other city. There's actually no fleeing logic. They just move with a certain chance per unit time. And and now they're spread, it's spreading within this other city. And others may go to others. Okay, four of the five cities have now triggered lockdowns, for example. And and we could go look at each city, for example. We could go over here to the developer panel, which you can call up with this little sort of um, component here. And you could call it up and you could dig into the population, whoa, of cities here, like the five cities. And within each city, what you would see is, and it's it's a little bit slow here in responding, but what will you see is, is a population and a certain number of people will be will be infected. Okay, it's running um, full steam here, so I'm I'm gonna have to slow it down. But uh, if we went down and we looked at uh, each city, for example, here, um, we could we could drill down and see the logic uh, for that city. So here we go, and uh, within this city, we have a population of 275 uh, people at the moment. Its initial population was 273, but some more people came into it, and its fractional prevalence right now is zero. No, now we drilled down to a particular person in the city. I think by double clicking on that, and and now I'm at the level of a of a particular person. But I can go up a level back to the level of the cities, for example, and I can go look at at another city, for example. Um, so here we have um, uh, another city which has a different population and um, and where also the infection is burnt out. There are a number of recovered people. Okay, so, so this is a multi-level model. This is a model which has not just one level of environment, but two levels. But the environment is active, right? There's mechanism at the level of the environment. We saw for cities, if the infection reached beyond, there's this event and it triggers periodically, and if the fractional prevalence of infection reaches beyond a certain threshold, um, an intervention will be declared. And really this should be wrapped up in a function to be nice, but basically we visually signal the intervention and we loop through the population and see if someone's eligible for the type of intervention we want. And if so, we perform an intervention upon them. We perform it upon them. And for those who are students um, of any logic um, or interested in that as a platform, this, this exhibits a certain degree of finesse, I must say, because we're using dynamic parameters uh, to capture um, logic here, such as the intervention. And different scenarios can say, my intervention will do this, or my eligibility criteria is that, and this will test it against the eligibility criteria specified by the um, uh, specified by the scenario with which we wanted to run it. But what I want you to carry away from this is that we can have models which have multiple levels of context, but also logic, mechanism, dynamics can go on at different levels. We can have outcomes at different levels. We can interventions and actions, contact tracing initiated at certain levels of aggregation at the home level or what have you. We could have um, uh, actions being taken that trigger a lockdown at a city level, et cetera. Okay, I want you to keep these models in mind as we go through the slides. I'm, I wanna give you some concrete points of reference as we talk through some kind of abstract issues with agent-based modeling. So that's why I situated you here. I'm of course glad in office hours to answer questions about these particular models, which did come from the hand of the instructor. So um, I will uh, now, having sort of gone through those models, I will switch over to our slides. Yes, a question. Great, I, I, could someone read the question out for me by chance? 
Is there an option to introduce seasonality of movement in terms of user centricity? Yeah, good question. So the question was uh, one particularly apt for the Canadian context. Um, is there uh, a mechanism to introduce seasonality into the uh, propensity of a person to say migrate between cities, to go between cities in the model? That would actually be quite readily done. And, and you know, my mind is going through several ways of doing it most elegantly. Um, one way would be to have a um, uh, have a state chart that goes through, you know, uh, summer, fall, winter, spring, um, each with a certain length. And for each of those, you would set the migration rate for people going between cities, the hazard rate of migration, the chance per unit time someone will migrate to a different value. Another way is you could look it up for the current day, what's the migration rate and calculate it at a, at a more fine-grained level. Um, probably the first would be enough or you could do it on a monthly basis very readily. In short, yes, it could be, it could be readily accomplished and, um, and that could capture some aspects of kind of seasonal effects that we see in, uh, in epidemiological data. So I, I like that idea. You might also capture the fact that people are more inside in the colder months of the year. Um, for those not from Canada, we have this thing here called winter and um, and people tend to spend more time inside in winter. Um, um, yeah, so um, you, can, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Um, okay, so um, great. So any other questions in the chat? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so let's uh, let's go to the slides if we could. And we're going to continue on from where we were last time, okay? So last time we, we spent a lot of time talking about problem conceptualization. And I, I noted the, the central role this plays in any modeling project. Models are like maps. They're useful because they abstract, abstract away from detail, but what they leave out and what they include is a function of the problem or the question that you're trying to answer, the problem you're trying to solve, which can, off, which can be phrased in general as a, as a question as well. Um, and um, and uh, because of that, um, there's a need to circumscribe the model so we can put fewer elements in. In HMAS modeling, there's less back pressure. We can put many, many things in quite readily. The computational mechanism is not, uh, is not as nearly as limiting. And so we can include many, many different things. And there's a need for a greater circumspection, um, care and self-discipline in what you put in. We also talked last time that, um, uh, that there's a need to not only use model purpose as a logical knife, but to cut away unnecessary complexity, but use time boxing, leave yourself sort of limited time, um, add things in incrementally, run the model, see the results, learn from it, recognize that um, you may be making your way towards a much richer model, but it'll be a much more savvy rich model if along the way you're learning as to what the next priority is rather than presupposing it based on your understanding at the beginning. Typically our understanding evolves hugely in a modeling project as to what's most important. And um, if you sit back and plan it all ahead of time um, and only work towards that, you will have shortchanged your opportunities to learn and your ability to understand where behavior comes from and the chances are to be much harder to debug them all. Um, those are some components of problem conceptualization. It's really carving out the set of essential items that we want to put in right now and learning from them by getting a running model, um, comparing its results to the, to the earlier version, um, learning from that and figuring out what, what comes next. Today, we're going to be talking about model mapping and model formulation. And, and let's talk about these things, if I could. I kind of put underneath these things a lot of things that are considered there. 
But I want to talk about this for agent-based models because in this area as well, there's lots of texture. For those who are coming from tr other traditions, compartmental system dynamics model in particular, you might um, recognize this construct. This construct is called a causal diagram. It is close to ubiquitous um, within a system dynamics modeling for at the model conceptualization phase and, 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 and to some degree model formulation phase, really. Um, it's, sorry, it's, it's more model mapping and model formulation. I, I, I shouldn't have said conceptualization, more model mapping and formulation. Um, so I wanna, I wanna make sure you're educated on this because these diagrams do come in. They are useful for agent-based models. We have used them for agent-based models. They have a lot of shortcomings for agent-based models, but they still deliver net value. Um, uh, and I wanna walk you through some of the elements of them. So in this sort of diagram, we have, it's, it's very simple and it's, it's designed you have these vertices and you have these arrows and the arrows are labeled by polarity. Um, and uh, what you can knit together here is often a very rich picture about, about the system. Um, a given arrow from A to B, say from substance abuse to stigmatization um, is basically positing something. It's postulating that A, your substance abuse, um, tends to affect causally, it tends to change B. Um, that, is a, that is something we posit, we, we postulate that that's the case. We hypothesize that that's the case, that you know, a substance abuse goes up, all other things being equal um, compared to the value it otherwise would have had the risk of stigmatization, occurrence of stigmatization will, will go up. The, that someone will be stigmatized for, for a substance abuse. Now, um, when I said that, I had a certain polarity and you'll notice that these labels are indicated have polarities, negative or positive associated. Each arrow has negative or positive polarity. Um, and these causal loop diagrams will have loops um, in a deep paths and then loops as an example of such a path whose polarity is induced by the polarity of the links within that diagram. So I'd like to talk through uh, a link, uh, the meaning of these polarities, because we go from the polarity of a link to the polarity of a path, and where that path is a loop to the polarity of that, of that loop. And you can see those in these sort of bigger polarities. These are two, what are called feedback loops here. On the left, we have a negative feedback loop. And on the right, we have a positive one. We'll come back to that point. But those are induced by the polarity associated with the links. So let's talk about the polarity associated with the links here. Um, and for the Canadians in the audience, I'm not talking about links L, Y, and X as much as I rather um, uh, I'm rather uh, attracted to those servile cats. I'm talking about links L-I-N-K-S. Um, I'm referring to these arrows as links. Um, uh, okay, so um, here, if we have uh, an arrow from A to B, hunger, say, to food ingested, and it's associated with a positive link, what it means is I pause it as hunger goes up, food ingested will tend to go up the food to be ingested will tend to go up. All other things being equal, meaning putting aside all other influences on that through that link, that link will tend to make food ingested go up compared to the value it otherwise would have had. So if I hadn't increased hunger, food ingested would have had a certain value. If I do increase hunger, it will tend to lead food ingested to be a higher value. That doesn't mean food ingestion is going up over time necessarily, it just means it's, it carries a higher value than it would have had I not increased hunger. Maybe the amount of food I'm ingesting for one reason or another is, is going down over time, but um, it's larger than it otherwise would have been because my, I, I have hunger operating. Um, with, if, hung, if I hadn't been hungry, it, uh, I would have eaten less. Okay, so 
So I, I put that on the next slide, if anyone wants to refer to that, that terminology. I do want to indicate that a lot of students get caught up in, in um, for when they forget one of those components I just had. So again, a link from A to B with a positive sign means if I increase A, hair hunger, it'll tend to increase B, all other things being equal. So just considering this link, it will tend to increase it compared to the value that B would have otherwise had had I not increased A. Okay, and similarly, a negative link, and I want you to watch this because students get especially confused about this. A negative link from, from a, a one variable to another, let's say from food ingested to hunger, now A is food ingested, B is hunger. If the fact that it's a negative link means as A goes up, as food ingested goes up, hunger will tend to go down compared to the value it otherwise would have had, all other things being equal. Um, so if, if I had not, ingested food, I would have had a certain level of hunger. The fact that I did ingest food means my hunger now is lower because I ingested the food, okay? So um, for those who, who are mathematically uh, comfortable um, uh, with, the, with the notation of calculus, this can be expressed as a partial derivative. Um, so a positive link between X and Y means that partial Y, partial X. Um, so change in Y given a certain change in X is, is greater than, than zero and a negative would indicate it's less than zero. Um, so, so these are the basic rules for causal loop diagrams for reason about links. And when you reason about a causal loop diagram, you, to assign a polarity, mark my words, you always think through that link in isolation. It's when you start to think about paths and the polarity of them, you start to think about multiple links in turn. And it turns out that, and you'll find me many videos of me giving detailed lessons on this, but the polarity of a path that might go from A to B and B to C and C to D, uh, the polarity associated with that path, the net effect of that path is given by the rule of signs. So in other words, you multiply the signs associated with, with each of these links. So if you have a negative, a positive link and a negative link, they combine, they multiply to be uh, a negative link. Um, you could think of this, those who are, who, are, who, who love uh, discrete mathematics like me will probably think of monoids, um, for example, but it, plus times a negative is a negative. Um, a plus times a positive gives a positive, uh, like over here on the right. If you had two negatives in a row or two negatives in the link and all else was positive, it would be a net positive because the two negatives would tend to, to counteract each other. We don't have time to go into this. I, you'll, I'll have whole, all, uh, whole lectures on this. Yes, wait. Mm -hmm. Can you comment on why the positive loop is the loop arrow sure. is in reverse to the oh it should, it should be it should be in the same direction it's it's in reverse because I was careless um, okay. so uh, I should have been more careful the the direction of the internal loop should be in the direction of the the lengths that form the loop um, so that was just carelessness on my part and. Um, you know, I, I'll, I appreciate that and I'll see if I can correct it and post the updated slides. Yeah, thanks a bunch. Um, okay, now causal diagrams are great and we use them a lot. Um, they're very insightful. Where they tend to shine is, is when you're dealing with a fairly flat situation where you have a bunch of different factors all operating at the same time. In agent-based modeling, it is typical that you have at least two levels of concerns, one at the level of an individual, dynamics at the level of an individual, 
and then dynamics at the level of the collective of the interactions between individuals on the population, if I could use that term. In some cases, we have more than two, right? Think about that hierarchical model. We have person, city, population as a whole. And there may be processes that are occurring at an individual level in terms of perception and what they're eating and their risk of exposure and the you know, risk behavior, et cetera. They may be you know, sensing risk based on people that have gotten infected in their network and lowering their risk behavior, you know, circulating less or wearing masks more, what have you. Um, but then there may be processes operating at the city level too. For example, when the city senses a prevalence over a certain amount to trigger a lockdown, um, there may be you know, certain measures that are put into place by a city in terms of rules for social distancing on public transit or, or rules for masking, et cetera, on public transit. So, so often there's processes at the city at, at the next level up. And in that hierarchical model, there might be processes at the overall population level, like certain cities are, are cut, their, their connections are cut in a sort of cordon sanitaire um, to sort of pro prevent uh, propagation from one city to another. So when we're dealing with this, this, this sort of construct of a, of a um, when we're dealing with these multi-level phenomena, this construct of a causal diagram starts to get kind of creaky because some of the effects are within a person, some of the effects are within the city, some of the effects are within the, the whole population. And, and there's a lot of other things that it doesn't express, you know, the aspects of my social context, my network connections, my geographic location, um, uh, aspects uh, associated with mobility, I think, it kind of falls flat in that area. It's not that it doesn't offer any value. Oh, well, it, it's, it's, it's good. You know, it, it offers some, some insight there and you can capture some insight, but it, it just doesn't quite fit. Um, it's like a glove that's designed for someone three sizes smaller hands or something like that, or shoes that are for someone with three larger sizes than yourself. So, you know, we've been working to try to adapt these sort of mechanisms for causal diagramming. And Jeff McDonnell, um, Sage of Sydney and, and, and work in the past, this is probably circa 2015 and I, you know, we, we really brainstormed about ways that we could capture um, in a kind of model mapping way, this way to sort of think through the connections, what depends on what, what affects what. That's what we're really trying to capture at this model mapping stage you know like what, what is it we're thinking affects what other thing what these things that we have in the model through model conceptualization what interacts with what what depends on what this is what we want to nimbly sort of sort through as we're engaged in model mapping sort of working through our thinking of how these things relate to one another at a very high level and so we came up with this little language, which, you know, we, um, we, we tried to describe these aspects of context, you know, geographic context and, um, and you know, uh, in, having interventions that affect certain lengths in the model, having within certain types of agents. So this might be the person agent, there might be a service dog agent, there might be a, you know, a, a, a psychiatrist agent. Um, and each of them has some of these aspects of state and, and changes between state as indicated, say, by state charts. And they're each associated with connections um, in which they can engage in interactions and maybe some mobility, uh, inclination to mobility. And maybe there's some sort of process mapping for discrete event simulation. So anyway, Jeff and I were brainstorming about this. We, we got somewhere. I, I actually think like mechanisms like this, while they're not formalized yet, they add something more than a causal loop diagram. A causal loop diagram, like stock and flow models traditionally, we're working to change that, but like them traditionally, they kind of flatten everything. 
And here we can start to reason about these different levels of nested contents. In principle, we could have populations within a person of diseases or, or what have you. And so, you know, we, we started exploring these ideas of sort of sketching out models and model elements or thinking on model dynamics just to kind of sharpen or think about what we want to add next into the model um, using these diagrammatic rec representations. Uh, this head is rather outsized. It, it has the appearance of a distended neonate. But um, you know we have uh, sort of parameters up here and then state and actions and rules down here, interventions that affect certain parts of the system. This is not well formalized now, but the the issue is, is the desire to be pragmatic here. Instead of force fitting everything into a causal loop diagram to try to, to be a bit more freer in your way of diagramming things. We also put together an interactive, this was actually a collaborative interactive um, tool, CQHM that we built up, um, which reflects in many ways the sort of tool that Eric is, is uh, leading on his is a quantitative modeling tool, and it's awesome for compositional modeling. Um, he and Long were working on it with some, some uh, suggestions from Sha Yen. But this is, this is a, a qualitative modeling tool that we built up with some other students of mine some years ago to sort of sketch these sort of models out interactively. And it's kind of like a Google Docs for qualitative modeling. Multiple people could, could use it at the same time. So qualitative modeling for agent-based modeling is a big need. It's a need that's under-resourced in the literature. It's a need where we're engaged in active thinking and research, but really you need, you want to engage in some flexible use of causal loop diagrams and probably don't be afraid to try something which kind of sketches out, okay, there's this type of agent which has these characteristics and this state and these parameters, this other one which might have these others, just to sort of nimbly think through the issues. It's to refine your thinking about what depends on what, what things interact with each other, how, you know, to what degree a person is affected by geographic location, et cetera. So just some thoughts there. Um, this is little served by the literature and I'm trying to give you some resources to think about. Um, let's, uh, and I, I posted a video uh, also on CQHM, where I where I describe some of these ideas and some of the shortcomings of of causal loop diagrams. Let's talk about model formulation, if we could. Um, model formulation and agent based models really consists of two pieces: um, model specification and model implementation. Um, and um, I'm going to highlight some of the challenges that this imposes. A lot of traditional agent-based modeling, um, you, you, you go light on specification, you just have an implementation. It's just an implementation. You, don't, you have no specification at a high level of what's going on. And that can be quite, um, um, quite difficult to, to get insight um, for certain types of needs when it's just a bunch of code. And more recently, uh, packages, um, and I'd include here NetLogo, uh, Repast, and, and led really by any logic, have tried to put more emphasis on some high level specification and trying to lessen the amount of, of coding you need to do for implementation. But let's talk about that. Let's talk about model specification. So for those, um, who are from a compartmental background. Um, I like to say that stock and flow, people using stock and flow models have hedgehog knowledge. They know one thing really, really well, and they apply it very, very cleverly to, to, to great insight. It's a small modeling vocabulary. The power lies in creative combinations of stocks and flows, elegant sort of ways of, of arranging them. Um, and uh, here, um, there's uh, 
you know, an analysis that's conducted, you look at the behavior over time of state variables or stocks or flows, et cetera. And there's a ubiquitous mathematical framework. In fact, several that are that are alternatives if, if you want to explore it um, for specifying model dynamics. Um, and you can get unambiguous specification of the dynamics of a model using ordinary differential equations, which uh, in most system dynamics packages are just the stock and flows turn into them directly. Um, and uh, there's deep knowledge about how to turn that into runnable code so that the person who is building the model doesn't have to worry about implementing code to realize it. Basically, they just create stocks and flows and typically the package says treats them, treat, treat these as ODEs, ordinary differential equations, and it knows how to run them and no code has to be written. And that keeps their focus on the stock and flow model. Very powerful, very powerful, very insightful um, types of modeling can come and it keeps your focus on the model. In agent-based modeling, I like to talk about it as knowledge of the fox. And this is of course, harking back to, to kind of Russian, the Russian aphorism comparing knowledge of the fox with knowledge of the hedgehog. Um, so with agent-based modeling, you have a large modeling vocabulary. You don't just have stocks and flows with you know, some auxiliary variables, dynamic variables and, and parameters. No, 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 you have, you have a much broader set of things. And, and um, I think I somewhere, oh, here, here we go. Um, hey, come on here. Um, you know, many types of issues come in um, for, for ABM implementations. You have many types of building blocks um that that come in i i have a better slide for that and I, I apologize i don't have that handy but um uh you have different subsets of vocabulary used for different models the power you have this enormous flexibility and combination of elements um you can you can perform analysis at different levels not just at the level you articulated not just at the level of a state chart or what have you um or of a message you can you can aggregate up from there. You can slice and dice the data from the population in different ways. You can basically look at spatial dynamics from the model, not just in terms of the stocks and flows out of which you built the model, but in terms of these other components. Now, critically, and this is important to realize about agent-based modeling, there's no single unifying mathematical framework that people have come up with for specifying these models. We have ODEs over here on the left, and those from you know substantive uh, compartmental modeling tradition may also recognize the critical value of delay differential equations, for example, or stochastic differential equations or stochastic discrete differential equations. Uh, all those are very well accepted, very well documented, and have quite good support. With ODEs being the overall you know, by far the most dominant one. Over here on the right, there's no such similar framework. There's no comparable framework for that. Um, we have different packages offering different frameworks. And often, traditionally, they left it to the modeler to kind of write code. They just write code for it. Um, you write your own. <laughs> Your own code. Now that code has a mathematical meaning. Um, there's there's a shallow literature that compares agent-based modeling to equation-based modeling, and said agent-based modeling is more powerful than equation-based modeling. It, it, in my view, it's bunk. I mean, um, there's underlying equations uh, describing the meaning of this in denotational semantics of programming languages. To say that agent-based modeling has no equations behind it is, is a shallow statement and reflects a very um, parochial, limited view of, of, of understanding of, of um, differences in model types. But the point is there's no unique model mathematical framework. But there are some that are, that are gaining traction. For example, state charts have appeared in repast after they appeared in any logic and are very widely used within other areas like software engineering. But here's the thing, code is frequently needed to operationally 
realize the meaning of agent-based modeling currently. Now, those who know a little bit more about our research program may know that we're working on frameworks where models are encoded as data. Um, you know, the logic is included as data and it can be optimized and transformed. These are based on compositional modeling techniques and applied category theory, um, where we, we, we basically um, eliminate the need to write sort of code in its traditional sort uh, sense. But those frameworks are still in their early inception for research. Um, uh, you know, and right now there's more, uh, there's more uh, of a disjunction where you have often have to write code to capture the meaning you're seeking to write. Yeah, so there's a question. Okay, so does someone, could someone read it out? The uh, chat message. By stock and flow model, do you mean the system dynamic model and event model? Yes, um, although in, in this, my comment here will have a certain resonance perhaps with Maurice because I've been corresponding with him about some related issues. Um, when I'm talking about stock and flow models, I'm talking about these sort of models that are that are the bread and butter of current system dynamics processes. Um, this, this, these are the bread and butter of sort of describing system dynamics models. Um, I, I, I tend to avoid equating it with system dynamics for two reasons. One, system dynamics also makes, contemporary system dynamics makes heavy use of causal loop diagrams too. And in fact, something called system structure diagrams. Um, and, and, and so it's not, coextensive with it's not one and the same as 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 stock and flow diagrams i talk about this as a stock and flow diagram which i view as one sort of prevalent diagram in system dynamics the other reason is is a philosophical one i i for one believe in a broader vision of system dynamics that is not um beholden to and purely defined in terms of stock and flow models with odes i think there's a much richer possible frontier for the system dynamics perspective to be brought to that it's not just reduced to you know three one or three types of of, of diagrams and um that's a controversial position um but i tend to be very specific about the, calling this a stock in flow diagram and it's broadly mathematically it's identical to a compartmental diagram with odes um, in its traditional use. Okay, so if that helps some of those in the audience unpack that mathematically, what we're talking about is compartmental models whose dynamics is encoded with ODEs here. Okay, and traditionally, when we describe a model like this, um, it has ODEs behind it um, uh, that state the rate of change of the number of infectives is given by. You know, the number of the, the the rate at which number of infectives is going up, um, if going up maybe as five people per day, it's rising by the number of infectives is rising by. Now it's a hundred. Tomorrow will be one hundred five, one one ten, and maybe that's because there are ten people coming in per unit time or getting infected, and only five people. So ten people per day getting infected and only five leaving. 10 coming in, five leaving per day, there's net five building up um, here. And so that's that's what this is saying, right? I dot is the rate of change of the number of infectives per day. So how quickly is it rising or falling? And it's given directly by the inflows, some of the inflows minus the sum of the outflows. And and this is this is you know, the defined way to traditionally treat stock and flow models. I think that's impoverishing myself. I mean, I actually think that they're much richer if you consider multiple semantics, but uh, I'm a voice in the wilderness um, at the moment. And um, and that's a, that's a matter of specification. Um, I will say that um, if we think about a simpler model yet, we're going to think about a model with immigration coming in at some rate M, and we're going to think about the population dying with a certain mortality rate alpha. So this might be 1% per day dying um, from you know, some 
horrible uh, affliction. And so the number of people dying per day, if we have a thousand people at risk and they have a 1% chance per dying of dying per day, a thousand people at risk, 1% chance per day, one out of a hundred died per day, how many people approximately will die in the first day? Anyone? So a thousand divided by a hundred, right? It's one out of a hundred died per day, and there's a thousand people at risk. One out of a hundred, yeah, um, one percent. So so it'll be ten per day, right? It's a thousand people at risk, one percent chance of each one dying per day. It'll be, sorry, one percent. No, no, it's it's ten per day. I mean, a thousand people at risk, one percent chance that each of them will die. It's ten people. Um, ten person per day. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. So uh, it's ten people per day that will that will die on average here, right? Um, so so here the formula for this is just alpha. That's the the chance per day times the number at risk. Um. So, so here we could characterize the equations. This is the model specification. We draw this out. This is totally given. This mode of description where I provide formulas for each, excuse me, each of these things, or if I provide formulas for each of these things, it, it entirely specifies the underlying equations. I just give formulas for each of these things. These equations are defined. And it turns out that in terms of model implementation for those sort of stock and flow models, there's you know well-defined implementation mechanisms based on numerical integration that will integrate. Um, it'll it'll perform numerical integration of this. This this is all given, but for a stock and flow model, um, if you start with this and it's totally specified, I have equations for all these different sort of things and vari variables. I can turn into equations automatically and I can solve it automatically numerically. And there's no code that's needed beyond this. This is the model that I'm dealing with and I can draw it and I can build it up and declare it and characterize it declaratively. And I can say, run, it takes care of all of it. That's compartmental model. That's the system dynamics model. And it's one of the reasons it's so powerful. By contrast, with ABMs, we're dealing with a totally different situation. We're dealing with a situation where, first of all, we need to define the ABM and there's no unique language. Um, I like to think through for model formulation, I'm thinking systematically through the elements of an ABM. This is the o op parties framework. Think systematically through what needs to be in the ABM. So when I go create a new ABM, often I'm thinking in terms of these things. I'm thinking about the outputs it needs to produce, the populations, why outputs? Why are they so important? Because those are the things often I care about, I wanna monitor. They're the things that I wanna compare with data. They're things maybe I wanna to calibrate to data. Um, I wanna assess their sensitivity. Um, I wanna know, you know, to compare interventions, uh, uh, which one is better in terms of these outcomes, et cetera. I have populations, one or more. Within each population, you have individuals, each characterized by, by some fixed characteristics, parameters, by some actions that change their state over time and some rules. Their state, that's the last one down here, which I put for the acronym at the end, but it's really conceptually, it comes before actions. Um, because it's actions that change state rules for triggering those actions for changing state. Think of the actions as the as the as this um, these uh, uh, these uh, types of transitions in the stock of uh, this uh, state chart like this. Think of the rules as the things that specify how often this fires. For example, with this rate, one over duration of infectiousness. Um, there's time, um, there's the characteristics of time, you know, what's the time horizon? Is it continuous? Um, it just goes, uh, in a continuous way, things happen as quickly as they need to, or is it discrete? It goes in sort of hops 
which is traditional and older agent-based models, um, a, a tick at a time, um, a time step at a time. Uh, what interventions need to be considered that change aspects of the state? What environment am I dealing with? Is it networked? Is it geographic? Is it continuous space? Is it gridded space? You can see the, the set of issues here are much broader than for, for a stock and flow model. This is comparatively straightforward to specify. Um, uh, this, gosh, we're thinking about the different sorts of, of things. Now, my framework is quite similar to one by my close colleague, Ross Hammond, uh, uh, formerly at Brookings. I think he's still somewhat there in a part-time way, but also with Washington University in St. Louis, where he talks about properties. I don't, I don't like I don't like it because it combines state and other characteristics, but many people like this framework. Um, I like to separate out what changes from what's fixed, um, but in Russ's, it, they're, they're combined together actions that change it, rules that govern when those actions take place. Same basic idea, time, what's the time horizon, time step or time units, um, and the environment. What's, what's the nature of the environment? Um, uh, I like to think about. Now, a third really useful component here is what's called the ODD protocol. And this is for description. This is a um, consensus protocol derived from a panel of folks who do agent-based modelers. Its primary focus is to specify models, to characterize them, to communicate them, like in the scientific literature. Um, and it can help understand those models, it can also help think through the elements of the model. And there's three broad components of this ODD protocol. Um, uh, an overview stage where, where you set model goals and high level scope and design. You basically describe the model, what it includes, what it excludes. Endogenous, exogenous is, and ignored is a good thing to use here. Design concepts. So here are different aspects of the design that, that you're using, sort of uh, components of the design um, and remaining elements. And the design is where there's uh, most of the components are there. And there's a, there's a reference, which, and in fact, it provided two references in one of the um, sets of slides I provided you this morning. Um, with this introduction to the ODD protocol. Here are the two kind of canonical, or two really good references for this. This book, which I really recommend, Agent-Based and Individual-Based Modeling, is one of the re reference text, texts for this course. Um, but uh, also there's a, an article here in, in the Journal of Ecological Modeling called the ODD Protocol, and they actually give a substantive update on it. I think it's ODD plus D, they have an additional additional component that they added in retrospect. So I provide a lot more detail in the ODD protocol here. These different components that are part of it and that you want to think through specifying, et cetera. Um, I don't have time to go over them now. Um, uh, were there were there a lot of interest? I might go over them uh, at a later at a later point. So let's. Um, Let's continue though to go through these uh, slides here. And somehow I think I, I got, um, gosh, I got out of, out of order. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so these are three ways of describing a model. The goal here for model formulation is to specify a model as crisply as you can. And, um, you know, at least enumerate its pieces in their relationship with one another. Like if you're doing a state chart, that's great. You have a state chart, you have different possible states with respect to a concern, you have actions to change them and rules, that's great. But you also wanna be thinking like, are there other things that change a certain rate? Like maybe the number of smokers for my friends change my predilection for initiating smoking. and and I would want to describe that. In general, with model formulation, you want to try to, try to specify uh, as closely as you can what, um, 
what um, uh, what what the mathematical characterization of the model is. Now, modern packages, and I, I want to particularly highlight AnyLogic's leadership in this regard. It's it's really probably the single biggest reason we use it beyond its high support for hybrid modeling. Is um, you know when you when you have high level components described in a model like this. When you build a model up out of things that are visual and where it's fully specified, like this migration event occurring every, you know, on a per day basis, according to a migration rate. When you specify these state charts, for example, here, um, or for a city, I have an intervention event going off periodically. This gets us closer to declarative modeling, to a situation where the, the, the system takes care of generating the code. We specify what we want to capture, like how often this should be firing, or how you know, at what rate someone should be transitioning from here to here, or transitioning to um, uh, to a state of uh, of recovery, or how often they should be communicating um, uh, infection to other, contacting other people. Here we're we're specifying it kind of declaratively. We say, look, take care of this, put this rate in place, make it happen at this rate, and that gets closer to, and it's a really important thing um, to what we see you know, with, with stock and flow model, with something like this. We keep our attention on the, the domain constructs that here at stock and flow models that describe the domain, describe the problem. With agent-based models, it might be events and state charts and so on. We keep our attention at that level. It takes care of making the underlying dynamics happening, putting in place the logic to make this happen, um, ma realizing that rate, making that rate occur, you know, putting in place the implementation of that rate. Um, traditionally, that's had to be that had to be implemented by code, and even in packages like NetLogo, there's more of a need to implement that in code, but. A growing number of packages are, including that logos made some moves in this direction, trying to allow for something going in the direction of stock and flow modeling or, or in the direction of declarative characterization like we have here. And really, I think you know that's the future of agent-based modeling. And the more elements you can keep in this visual fashion, the clearer your model will be to yourselves to stakeholders, the more nimble it will be to evolve because you don't have to redo a bunch of coding every time you change the state chart. 10 years ago, no. 20 years ago, you didn't have this. You basically would have to capture the state chart in code. You'd write C++ code or Java code that would realize the state chart. That's actually a fair bit of work to sort of realize this. And now it's generated automatically. But the fact is that it's incomplete, that if we go and we look at HMS models of any, any significance, you will find quite a bit of code around the edges. Uh, this migration event, it occurs at this rate, but when it happens, I say, go to the population, pick me a random location, set that to be my location and connect me up with other people there. Or if I go to the GIS model here, and you go to person, you will find that while I can sketch out at a high level, the logic with a state chart and with stock and flow models and with these sort of action charts, if you go and you poke around a little bit more um, carefully, you will find, oh, there's some code, you know, that sort of performs some key co computations that I have to, that I have to write. Um, and uh, that, and here's another one like this eat meal event here. Um, so if I were to 
go find that in in this um excuse me it should be uh eat oh eat meals the state chart i'm sorry um uh but we do have code and a fair bit of code around that will basically uh perform certain certain actions so the the basic gist is you know, agent-based models are not nearly as easy to, to capture that implementation. And so when I say that in agent-based models, there's really this distinction here. What we're really talking about is specifying an ODD or op parties or parte framework, specifying the model in English. Sometimes you use things like flowcharts other sort of sketches, you might say this occurs with the rate given by such and such, but the implementation typically requires some coding and often a lot of coding, often a fair bit of coding. There are in the packages some attempts to get more support for declarative specification where the implementation is auto-generated. That's where We'd love to go as a field. I would love to go as a field. Um, and I think it's it's very important. And a lot of our research has been designed to try to try to move something towards like a self-documenting specification where the implementation can be taken care of in terms of its details. But we're still at a place where for any sort of big model, there's there's quite a bit of code that that is needed. Um, and I could point to some examples. Okay, so looking to to wrap up here, um, uh, let's 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 talk um, about a few other uh, components here. So one thing is when it comes to model uh, scope, um, there's a philosophy of modeling which comes out of Rails Beck and Grimm's work. I mean, Volker Grimm has been the most well, vocal participant of it or a proponent of it, which you know argues that agent-based modeling um, can be a lot of agent-based modeling can be driven by um, the the desire to capture certain types of patterns that we observe in the mall uh, in the in the world. I think of these as kind of similar in kind to system dynamics reference modes, except here reference modes are not limited to behavior over time, but behavior uh, over space, over networks. You'll find people talk about reference modes sometimes more generally in system dynamics as well. But, but the idea is that we have some behavior we observe in the world um, and we want the age based model to generate that, to give rise to that. Um, and this may be at a multiple scales. It may be spatial or geographic in terms of patterns of heterogeneity. And we're thinking a model that will explain or stay true to these patterns. So um, Volker Grimm has an article in Science Magazine um, with an ecology lens where he advocates for a pattern-oriented model. Um, and um, in the Michigan School, these are of agent-based modeling, which is a, 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 a very uh, dominant one or has been a, a very influential one. Um, these are often referred to as stylized facts. Patterns are, are pieces of information um, that we really want to replicate um, by the model. And if we didn't, it would cast suspicion on the model. They're typically specific to the type of model purpose. And, um, and sometimes, you know, even weaker patterns, they don't have to be quantitative. They may be things like the rates are higher in women than men. And we want to capture those in, in order to build confidence about a model. So here, patterns, observed patterns, emergent patterns from the model. The, the, the statistical patterns we see in model results, the spatial patterns, the geographic patterns, the patterns of, of, of a person goes through over time, waves of, of some phenomena in the infection uh, or in, over time in the, in the model results. These are seen as kind of validating the model, sort of help 
help um, cross check that it it's uh, suitable, that it's adequate. So we might you know capture patterns like this, these sort of cyclic patterns we see in childhood infectious diseases. Maybe we want to capture the fact you know that STI rates in Canada were declining, reported rates of STIs, chlamydia, gonorrhea were going down for some years, and then they started to rise um, uh, to, to much higher levels. Um, we might want to capture longitudinal um, patterns. Um, uh, so for example, um, the cumulative percentage of individuals who have who have caught uh, TB, for example, um, by, by a certain age. Or maybe certain types of network patterns, network structure, this is from TB networks, from, from empirical data here in Saskatchewan, involving contacts between people um, uh, at risk of, of TB transmission. Um, or patterns in obesity spread or, or mental health uh, distress um, in networks. Um, there can be spatial patterns, this is from work by, by John Wiley, and, and we've talked about this for, uh, for rabies um, and spread of zoonoses. Um, these patterns have to do with uh, heterogeneity, sort of how many people tend to have, you know, a certain number of sexual partners, for example, capturing the heterogeneity in the population as a result of your mixing algorithms within the model should capture the sort of heterogeneity we see in the world where people over here with are very few in number with lots of partners, but they may be very, very influential in keeping the infection active in the population. Um, uh, and yeah, these are these are patterns emerging from say an agent-based model. Um, okay. Um, so you know when it comes to patterns, um, if you if you look at the work of Grimm, for example, you may be struck by the desire to capture patterns in nature, things like walking patterns or oscillations or or waves that are seen clustering. Um, these are the sort of, of patterns that may motivate an ABM to capture certain components. Okay, I'm going to finish up here um, in just two or three minutes with a final note here on the process side to which we'll return later in the class. So we've been talking somewhat, somewhat, um, uh, somewhat frustratingly and adequately, in my view, of some of the challenges associated with model conceptualization, formulation, and then importantly for agent-based modeling, often there's this implementation need to capture things as as code. But you know, just like with uh, with software, where typically we build software and then we use it for years and modify it over time. Models are commonly built, but then get used um, on an ongoing basis and evolve. Um, they evolve according to needs. And there's this constant learning going on with modeling, even much more so than with software, in fact, where modeling is boosting learning and that's leading us to re-examine what's, uh, what's happening. And, you know, if you have a model that's evolving over a long period, if it's used for decision making in organizations, like like Wade's model that he created, you know, started creating before the the COVID nineteen pandemic and has been used by multiple jurisdictions uh, here in Canada as well as in Australia, um, uh, that's been used for years now. If you have a model like that, there's a need over time to prune it consciously. It's not just a matter of layering in new needs, new features for new types of insight. There's a need to, just like with a fruit tree, to cut away areas of it that are um, vestigial, that are no longer needed. So basically, as ABMs evolve, um, this is true for other dynamic models too, they frequently accrete cruft. They accrete this these elements that are outdated, they had a purpose once, but they're no longer relevant to the current decision-making context or current insights. Maybe they're about interventions that are no longer considered. Maybe they're about um, types of therapeutics that are no longer used. Maybe they are about um, 
types of uh, questions that we don't need to address anymore because they've been thoroughly evidenced in the literature. Um, so models that seek long service, you know, uh, often become top heavy and, and they develop a certain burden with them. And what one wants to do here is to consciously prune them over time. And often this occurs with optimizing the performance of the model, speeding it up, seeking to simplify it, seeking to, to sort it, to sort out what you need now from what's no longer needed. And you keep old versions of it to be sure, but you simplify and you simplify according to your learning. Um, uh, so here you, you often will simplify the design and conceptualization. You change what you want to represent, perhaps restrict it from what was anticipated earlier. Um, but you want, will also generally change the model implementation. That may be code. You may remove elements of code that are not needed or mechanisms for outputting data that it is not going to be looked at going forward, et cetera. So, so often there's this refactoring component that is needed and when I try, use refactor, I'm using that loosely because often it does mean changing model, like what exactly the model does, refining it a little bit, um, you know, restricting the design somewhat or restricting what's represented in there because you realize through sensitivity analysis um, or because changes in policy discourse or, or needs, certain things are just not needed anymore. Certain distinctions are not ones we have to put our, a lot of effort into. The data quality is not there to support it. Let's remove it, et cetera. So, you know, when we, when we have models that are used over long periods, it's inevitable that they become weighty. It's typical they just accrete this stuff that we have to flush out of them. We have to periodically remove it. For um, to keep the model nimble and to keep it um, to keep it from becoming a burden for us that that can only evolve uh, very painfully and becoming slower and slower. So there's just some thoughts. So I've shared with you, ladies and gentlemen, these past two lectures this week, thoughts on the IBM modeling process. Rarely, rarely um, address topics but I think one's very important for your coming projects. I look forward to joining with many of you tomorrow um, uh, to, to help spur the formation of teams. And I'd ask you as you embark on your modeling projects to keep some of these points in mind, build your model incrementally, leave things out, apply the Yagany principle, you ain't gonna need it, um, only put in essential things. Um, learn from the model along the way. Keep it within 30 minutes of running at all times, as Jeff McDonald says, if at all possible. Um, try to learn from it along the way. Try to reflect on that to figure out what is the next priority. Um, try to ensure that beyond just the model implementation, you have some description of the model at a higher level. Try to make use of those high level model elements we talked about today. Lay out what's endogenous, exogenous, and ignore. Use a framework like the ODD framework, the Parte framework, or op parties to think systematically what needs to be next representing your model. What's the scope of it? Those are all, all the comments we have time for today, but I would welcome uh, in office hours um, any further discourse about these matters. Thank you very much.